Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Erickson, and I'd like to thank the organizers of the Geeky Conference for putting on this great event. My paper is called IP in the Multiverse. So in our universe, innovation is difficult, right? It incurs costs, which could come in the form of um, skill and training, money, effort, creative thought that goes into coming up with a, with a new innovation. And these investments are encapsulated in intellectual property. There are two main justifications for extending intellectual property protection to innovations. The first is utilitarian, which sees the purpose of intellectual property as creating conditions for the maximal um, circulation of innovations and creations. And the second is personality theory, which understands um, innovations and creative outputs as inherently linked to our uh, personhood, to, our, to ourselves. And um, we're going to focus mainly on the first justification today, but both are potentially implicated um, when we start talking about the multiverse. So what is the, the multiverse? Well, if you're a science fiction fan, you already know what it is, right? It's this idea that um, there could be infinite realities out there, uh, different versions of, of our world where different things happen, maybe that have their own uh, path dependencies where local people have um, tried different solutions to the problems they face and come up with entirely uh, different, and, and, and weird, um, dif different and weird realities. And this was uh, uh, exemplified in the 2022 film, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, where Michelle Yeoh's character traverses the multiverse and experiences all of these different realities. Um, the more entrepreneurial minded among us might think, hey, if I could traverse the, the multiverse and see all these different worlds and, and ideas, what if I could bring some of those back to our world? Um, you know, I might be able to uh, profit from uh, these innovations that, um, you know, uh, we didn't know about. And there would be an infinite number of them. Well, that's obviously science fiction. Um, there are some potential similarities and, and relevance to uh, developments in generative AI, right? We can imagine a situation where an operator of a powerful generative AI system might be able to simulate um, nearly infinite realities and explore a possibility space without ever leaving their desk or their current reality and bring some of those ideas uh, to life. And not only that, but they can also index, retrieve, um, iterate and test and simulate to improve the ideas that they find to make even better products. So the, the research question or the thought experiment that I'd like to explore in this talk is what are the implications for innovation policy and particularly copyright that result from these multiverse-like conditions that we might find um, as generative AI advances? So um, there are some theories and some previous research that might be instructive here. I think it could be useful to look back, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago to the period when digitalization first disrupted um, innovation in, in creative industries by driving down the cost of marginal copying as Watt explored at the turn of the millennium. Essentially, because of digitalization, uh, users and pirates were able to make perfect copies of cultural goods and, and innovations like music, film, et cetera, and share those across the internet. And this technology was so disruptive that some observers and creative industry uh, participants described it as similar to having to compete with free. Right? How can we market? How could we invest in um, you know, making films or music when uh, they can just circulate freely online? Now, um, firms and innovators did manage to evolve and um, develop business models that allowed them to ap appropriate some value from their innovations, uh, as explored by folks like Tease. Um, 
And we've also had research uh, into, you know, what, if any, intellectual properties role uh, can be in shielding industries from um, technological disruption, and also intellectual properties role in the system of follow-on innovation, whereby um, a downstream user might borrow from a, a, an existing idea or expression and build, build upon it. We've also seen um, uh, you know, cries for more involvement of users and audiences in the innovation process uh, that's come along with, it, with digitalization. And so we've heard about things like user-led innovation from Von Hippel and Producage and other kinds of sort of semi-professional and um, amateur co-creation. Um, not all of the effects of digitalization and digital disruption were negative. Um, some observers suggest that uh, it can be beneficial, particularly for, from a consumption point of view. Anderson points uh, to the long tail effect. And um, Waldfogel discussing how digital technologies were brought into uh, the creative production workflow describes it as somewhat of a golden age because suddenly we had you know, um, a massive uh, increase of entrance into uh, cr creative production that created more uh, um, products that users could enjoy. So I think that we need to kind of uh, hold back our enthusiasm about generative AI somewhat um, and understand that you know, as disruptive as it may be, it's also part of a long-term um, disruption that's already been happening for the, for the last three or four decades. I'd like to zero in a bit more on Waldfogel's contention um, that an increase in production has taken place and that this is potentially beneficial for, for consumers. So on the left is a graph from uh, Waldfogel's uh, research about television. And this shows the expanding number of new TV shows that have been produced since 1960. This is somewhat counterintuitive to the zero marginal copying story, right? Because um, rather than, uh, you know, uh, uh, serve as a disincentive to, to creation. Um, television shows continue to be produced and they are produced in even greater numbers than ever before, despite the possibility of, of piracy and, um, and uh, internet distribution. So the number of, of uh, creative products is increasing. The chart on the right is a graph which shows um, the experimental results that Microsoft obtained in trying to improve its Bing search engine. And in this paper, the researchers had access to the effective um, outcomes of a bunch of experiments, many, many that Microsoft ran to try to improve its search engine results. And what's interesting is that um, in this distribution, a great number of the experiments they ran produced no benefits at all. And in fact, some of them were, were produced negative uh, results. So obviously they didn't implement those. But there were a small number of improvements that the company found down in that right hand corner of the distribution that yielded uh, significant positive results for the company. But those results were rare in the overall number of um, innovations that were potentially possible. So here, combining a massive increase in um, innovation from uh, digital technologies, along with this uh, principle of you know, a small number of innovations yielding, yielding positive results, we can see that um, there's a potential for both quantitative as well as qualitative improvements uh, in innovation if we're only able to run more and more tests to find those uh, hidden gems. So, um, you know, here we start to see the effects of being able to uh, have many, many, many draws at the urn. You know, here's a, a scary headline that uh, data scientists were able to locate 40,000 new uh, chemical weapons from running a machine learning uh, system on um, a, a bunch of chemical uh, compositions in under six hours. They were able to do that. So we're talking about a real um, massive increase in the amount of innovation that's possible. And some uh, have, have suggested that what we're heading towards is uh, a situation in which creating original works, entire new works, also approaches zero. Um, so we could call this zero marginal content. I prefer zero marginal creativity. But the idea there is that, um, you know, whereas zero marginal copying uh, was about making a perfect copy of an existing work, 
Um, zero marginal creativity is about being able to produce an almost infinite number of different versions of a, of a single idea and explore those. So this is a very potentially very disruptive, but in different ways from, from the copying story. So let's look at some possible effects in um, a creative industry. So let's think about low budget film, which I think is, a, is an interesting case. So this film on the right uh, really exists, and, and we'll get to this in a moment. It's part of a kind of micro budget or very low budget um, genre of film, um, which you know um, still exists and finds audiences. And these are films which are made for you know maybe less than a hundred thousand dollars. A hundred. It's hard to make a film for less than a hundred thousand dollars when we consider the actors and the settings and the equipment and everything that's required, all the way up to around two million dollars, which is still considered to be a small amount of money uh in in hollywood but the film uh, sharknado uh had a budget of of two million so it's perhaps on the upper end of this low budget um genre but um imagine a conversation between two users a news story um uh, comes up that a, a shark in the florida keys has consumed a huge amount of cocaine that it found floating in the ocean and an internet user said hey did you hear about this news story and another internet user says wow you know wouldn't that make a great um a great movie, a great creature feature flick. Um, and so at the moment, these micro budget films kind of respond to those internet memes, but they do so rather slowly. You know, it takes months for these things to, 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 to come out. But if we had access to a powerful enough um, AI system, we might be able to just spin up that film and look at it almost immediately, right? And instantly respond to something as low threshold as an online joke. Uh, if the costs could be reduced enough. And with zero marginal creativity, we might be talking about reducing the costs several orders of magnitude um, below what they are now. So we could imagine maybe being able to, um, you know, rent a, a, a computer cluster for a few hundred dollars uh, and be able to 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 produce um, a feature like a feature length film. This potentially radically changes the um, the relationship between audiences and and, and creators. So let's consider some accelerants and some, some potential tampers to this trend. So as the cost of innovation approaches zero, this perhaps permits uh, radical efficiencies in scope and scale. And um, you know, following on from Chris Anderson's long tail, it allows us to potentially meet even smaller communities of niche demand, um, micro communities that have very, very particular interests, almost down to the individual. And um, we could see a proliferation of tools that reduce um, network effects or overcome existing network effects. It's like, for example, if we think about uh, word processing, rather than pay a license fee to Microsoft in the world of zero marginal content, we might uh, spin up our own personal word processor that better suits our particular writing style and needs and avoids having to pay that um, you know, uh, license. So we can invent around barriers uh, depending on how low the cost threshold gets. Now, some tampers though that might stand in the way of this, um, this happening. So one thing as Watt pointed out for uh, zero marginal copying, the cost never gets to zero, right? Pirates have some costs, even though they're very low. And the same is probably true for for generative AI products, right? It can, compute will still cost some amount of money and there'll still be costs, but they might be very small. Now, incumbent creative companies and innovators might be able to stay ahead of the curve by investing in equipment and technologies that make their products stand out, that are make them better than what the generative AI can produce. Maybe in terms of like fidelity, resolution, quality, other, other aspects of the work that um, just aren't available to the users of generative AI systems. Could also um, anticipate there being some gatekeeping or choke points that might uh, prove to be important. So if we think about the university system, we ask all of our students to submit their assignments uh, in a PDF format. Um, so the Adobe PDF standard um, being important in the university setting might keep people clustered around um, those you know, particular uses because obviously they'll need to, to be compatible in order to submit their work to the university. And it will also depend a, a great deal on how concentrated 
um, the compute resources are that are necessary to achieve this multiverse-like condition. If, if computation is really um, concentrated among a few firms, that makes it easier to apply a policy lever to those firms and eliminate you know, intellectual property infringement and enforce um, rights. If it's more distributed and available to everybody, it makes it harder to, to um, keep things under control. So let's think about how this potentially interfaces with the existing rationale and justification for copyright. So one issue is that we might be confronted by radical oversupply. Part of the utilitarian justification, as you know, uh, Walt Vogel uh, describes, is that we want there to be lots of innovations and creations circulating. But is there a theoretical limit beyond which things become more difficult? Could we experience a kind of information glut where it becomes almost impossible to find the right innovation among a sea of others that um, you know, prevent us from, from finding the right one? And is it always better to have more um, or is there maybe diminishing returns after, after a certain amount? Certainly inventing around becomes potentially more appealing rather than have to pay an upstream rights holder for a license to build upon their, their innovation. Um, if we can just uh, ask a AI system to create a different alternative version, then we don't need to worry about paying a license. And this potentially um, you know, turns the entire follow on innovation um, uh, license and incentive system on its head. Enforcement and search costs uh, definitely increase for rights holders as there are more and more potential infringing uses out there in this multiverse. It becomes very hard to locate and detect uh, infringing works and enforce that. And what happens when uh, we can all have our own individual word processor? Um, monopolies obviously um, have negative as well as potentially positive effects. Um, we might be negatively locked into a standard that we can't um, escape from, and it could be uh, unfavorable to us. But on the other hand, we do uh, potentially benefit from network externalities by being part of a consensus uh, standard where we benefit from there being lots of other users. For example, the fact that document files are interoperable with one another. So if there's a bespoke solution for every user or every viewer, um, does that uh, does it have welfare effects um, and what do those look like? So concluding thoughts, um, we could be bold and say that uh, our innovation and creative production systems face perhaps the most profound disruption uh, from the past 40 years from the multiverse-like effects of generative AI. This thought experiment of thinking about um, Gen AI as a multiverse, uh, I think has been useful because it helps us to grasp the scale, which is nearly infinite, and the quality, which is potentially higher, that um, emerge from the ability to explore a possibility space and select those um, you know, creative hits or um, innovations that have outsized beneficial effects and bring those into the world. So a next step, I think, is to try to identify the sectors and activities that are likely to be impacted earliest uh, as a kind of forecasting signal. And uh, the creative industries have already been used um, widely as a kind of a canary in the coal mine to register and understand the um, incoming effects from digitalization. Um, so, we, so in areas like low budget filmmaking, micro budget films, I think this is an area where we should be looking because this is, a, this is an area where um, you know, being able to respond quicker to smaller and niche communities is certainly something that those films are already trying to do and Gen AI, Gen AI might just accelerate that. And finally, um, it seems likely that intellectual property protection might be one lifeboat that policymakers and incumbent firms sort of reach for first in response to the disruptions which might come from generative AI. But as we've seen here, um, it may be that intellectual property is ill-fitted to um, meeting that challenge, or it might on its own not be sufficient to, to meet the challenge. So we should be thinking about alternatives in policy besides intellectual property that might be helpful um, in this kind of world where everything becomes available all at once. Thanks very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions and comments.